Hello, everybody. It is uh, very humbling and an honor to be here to speak with you all today. Um, I'm going to start off in high school, I guess. Uh, when I finished high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I'm a little bit closer now. Um, but I did go to university, uh, mostly due to peer pressure. All of my peers were going to university, and I just kind of felt, OK, that's the thing to do. So without really knowing a direction to take, I chose to study kinesiology and health science with the reasoning of, if I'm going to learn something that I don't really know what I'm going to do with, I may as well figure out how I can be healthy. So I finished a four-year degree in kinesiology and was left in the exact same situation. Um, although I had a degree, I still had no idea what I wanted to do, and I kind of spent a few years trying to figure that out. I was in construction, renovations, until I felt as though there was something missing and that there was more that I could be doing and I was really looking for a challenge. I quit all my jobs and got back in touch with a professor that I had been connected with back in undergrad, uh, Dr. Paul Ritvo, and I started volunteering with him, and the volunteer work turned into my master's. And I found out a calling. I was able to use the love of health and the love of understanding how the body works and its mechanisms, and instead of thinking about how I could be healthy, I started thinking about how I could apply that to help other people be healthy. And so that brings us to the big idea. And the big idea in the Faculty of Health is how to keep more people healthier longer. And there's a good reason that we want to figure this out. This is a pie chart showing the distribution of resources in the province of Ontario, taken right off the province of Ontario website. We spend about 40% of our entire budget on healthcare. That's close to $50 billion per year. That's not taken up by everybody equally. Uh, the people that take up the most amount of money are typically char characterized by having and living with what we call a chronic disease. And so why this is extremely concerning is if you look at the stats over the last 20 years, for example, you notice that rates are increasing. So on the slide is diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity, just because they're relevant for the talk. And to connect it with the other slide, to give you an idea, in 2010, we spent almost $5 billion on just type 2 diabetes, expecting to go up to about $7 billion by 2020. And so the current system is not sustainable, and we have to do something about it. So I'm a part of a research team, and it's wonderful that I get to be here to talk to you about it, that is pioneering and testing out the idea of a health coach. So these are some of them. These are some of the health coaches we work with. Um, we're running research trials at different hospitals and community centers across Toronto in a huge, huge grant testing the efficacy of a health coach. And what is a health coach? Oh, first of all, I'm going to show who they really are. That's a little bit better. OK. Um, a health coach is an individual, a new role in, health, in the healthcare setting, where they get teamed up with you one-on-one, -on -one, and they help you establish and reach whatever health-related goals you are interested in obtaining. Let it be exercise, or diet, or stress management. It doesn't matter. Their role is to help you succeed at being the healthiest person that you can be. And the, re the way that we really excel at this, what really tips the cake on the idea of health coaching, is the use of technology. Because if we just add another healthcare provider to the roster, we're just increasing the price tag on our health system. But if we can leverage technology to communicate with a huge number of people at one time, we can extremely reduce the cost associated with this. And so to give you an idea, as far as smartphones go and the technology, mobile technology specifically that's out there right now, your phone can measure your steps and measure how often you're running and keep track of your sleep patterns. Newer technology is showing that we can beam wirelessly ECG, uh, heart rhythm, uh, electrical rhythms of your heart via Bluetooth, wirelessly, to your smartphone. And once any kind of information reaches your smartphone, it can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world. Earlier this year, Google announced that they were working on a contact lens that can measure the glucose levels of your through your tears once a second and send that signal, send that information to a smartphone with an antenna thinner than a human hair. Like, we're in the future. This is amazing. And if you have type 2 diabetes, you understand the pain of having to prick your finger multiple times a day to check your blood for how you're regulating your blood glucose levels. Not only is it painful, but you're expected to test before and after you eat, before and after you exercise, when you wake up in the morning, and when you go to bed at night. And it costs about a dollar a strip. So not only is it the physical barrier, but there's a financial barrier to that as well. 
So from a tech point of view, we partnered with a software company called NextJ Systems, a Toronto-based software company, and we helped to design an app for people to keep track of how healthy they are. So a few behaviors that they would track, things like how I feel, and a simple five-point scale. I feel great, I feel good, I feel not so good. And they can even write a little note if they like. They can keep track of their exercise, of course. I'm in the School of Kinesiology, we're focused on exercise. Um, how intense was their exercise routine? and how long were they exercising for. And it can be, of course, customized to whatever they want to do. Because we're working with specifically people with type 2 diabetes, they can enter in their blood glucose levels. And the other really great feature of the app is the uh, meal journaling, specifically using photos. So actually, literally taking a picture of the food that you eat um, and then subjectively rating it. Um, how big is the portion size? How big do you perceive it to be? Um, is it store-bought? Is it restaurant-bought? Or is it homemade? And how healthy do you believe it to be? And now there are lots of apps out there that do this. But whereas ours is a little different is the clinical integration with their health coach. So this is what we see. Online, through a secure portal, we can chart out our clients' glucose levels. The more data they enter, the more information that we have in order to help, them, help coach them on the best behaviors that they can do. We can superimpose this over their diet um, and exercise to see how they fluctuate. And also, if you want to look specifically at their diet, we can see a whole photo journal and then zoom in and see whether or not they've been um, eating what their dietitian has been recommending for them. So this, this looks pretty good. Um, and so here we were, academics, behavior science researchers, interested in health behavior, working with a software company, which is for profit, and that's OK. And we were looking for a group to work with. So we partnered with the Black Creek Community Health Center in Jane and Finch. Now, the community of Jane and Finch, we should talk about it a little bit. Unfortunately, the perception of the community in the news media is incredibly skewed and uh, vilified. People are stigmatized by the intersection that they live in, as if there's something magical and mysterious about the intersection, when the reality is the community is made up of regular people living their lives, going to school, going to work, raising families. But it's not to say that the community is not without challenge. And some of those challenges specifically stem from poor economic opportunity unemployment and poverty. So we partnered with a healthcare organization, a community health center, which is a beacon of hope in our healthcare system, a truly grassroots community-based healthcare organization that has dietitians, nurses, chiropodists, community health workers, social workers, physicians, all on an interdisciplinary disciplinary team and all very much focused on community health. It was the ideal place where to start our program and to integrate health coaching. But we came into a very specific and very quick obstacle that needed to be overcome. And that was the lack of exercise. And just to reiterate, there's the three partners, academic, corporate, and community. And all there with the shared vision of how really when it boils down to it to change the system. But the system, the, one of the first systematic barriers we came into was the exercise. There are no community-based and clinical exercise programs. Well, okay, there, there are a few. The largest clinical exercise program that exists in Ontario, anybody have any idea what it is? Where you can go and exercise with the supervision of an exercise physiologist or a registered kinesiologist? It's cardiac rehab. It's the largest clinical exercise program that exists in our province. But it has very, very specific entry criteria you have to have had a heart attack. Or, or nearly have had a heart attack. Maybe had some stints in, uh, perhaps had a stroke, and you can get certain referrals if you have type 2 diabetes. But it's not accessible to everyone. There's no focus on prevention. And we know, we know very well, uh, very much grounded in the literature, that exercise is good for you. I'd love to go one-on-one -on -one with somebody. If you want to challenge that, that's cool. Um, but as far as the research shows, exercise is very good for you. So why are we not addressing it in our healthcare system at the preventative level? Yes, there are public health promotion campaigns, but not a place where people can come in and actually learn, okay, I know I have to exercise more. My doctors told me that. My dietitians told me that. How do I do it? I, can I just leave, walk out the door and go for a run? Is that the answer? Well, we figured, okay, well, let's build one. So we did. It actually came with the recommendation of a community member in, uh, that we met on our first tour of the facility. They said, well, why don't you build an exercise room here? That'll solve the problem. Okay. 
and we literally moved in the next day with the exercise, with the mats on the ground, the treadmill, the two bikes, weights, and resistance bands, because we didn't want to lose the space. And this was a space where we could teach exercise, teach safe and effective exercise to our clients with type 2 diabetes, and who also have high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. But we had a very important mission with this, and that was, as researchers from York University with resources, we were coming into a community that, that doesn't have a gym. The closest gym to, in Jane and Finch is actually here on campus at York University, is Tate McKenzie. There's no place, really, for anybody to exercise. So we made it open to everybody. It didn't matter if they were a study participant. It was open to anybody in the community that was interested in learning. Of course, this created a challenge because all of a sudden, we weren't funded, really, to do this. We were creating the room on the research funding, but actually helping people wasn't. So we had to look for help. And the first place that we thought of, the best place to look at, was the School of Kinesiology and Health, and Health Science at York University. Because this is a very much a collection of people who have dedicated their undergraduate degrees to learning how to be healthy. So we sent out emails, and we invited students to come to the community and share what they've learned with anybody who is interested in learning. So that program started in February of 2010, so it's now a full four years. And we've had over 2,000 community members register for the program, and we've mentored over 225 undergraduate students from the School of Kinesiology through the program. And it created a system that was sustainable. And the reason that I can say that very confidently up here is that when we leave, when our study, when the research trial is over at the end of this month, actually, um, and the research ends, there are two full-time exercise physiologist registered kinesiology positions that will continue to exist, that are now on staff at Black Creek, and it's now a fully established, sustainable program. So I guess all in all, the idea of partnering in, in a dynamic way with corporate, with academic, and with community to really go about creating social change and attracting people to you that are like-minded, that want to be an advocate for change, it's possible. And just because you're partnering with a corporation or somebody in the community, it, it, overall, with a good focus, you can create amazing things. And we are in the situation now where it is needed. And I guess I'm just going to leave you off with a quote of somebody who's very relevant uh, to the discussion, Tommy Douglas, the father of our healthcare system. And it's courage, friends. It's not too late to build a better world. Thank you.